Welcome to the Discover Prophetic Truth in Scripture broadcast with your host, Dr. Anthony Earl. We will unpack the Word so that the strategies of God can be revealed. This program airs daily at 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Follow us in studying the entire Bible this year. We pray that this teaching helps to bring God's Word to life and gives you practical application to enhance your daily living. Let's go right into today's teaching. So as we prepare our hearts to study and go back into the book this morning, think in terms of learning keys for your spiritual breakthrough. We're going to to, to discover keys, principles that will help you break through spiritually. And Nehemiah is an excellent, excellent model for us to, to, to study because he is an example. God has put him in the book to be a model to us. And as we study the psalmist, learning how to pray and how to endure during hardship. And then back to James, going to James and James teaching us that faith without works is dead. This is, this is a hidden mystery. Many people don't understand. People think that their faith should be private and personal. No, your, your faith must be driven in action, that you must walk out your faith so that people may see your faith. And what it does, it builds you, it grows you, it strengthens you, it enhances you. So as we study the scriptures, let's pay close attention to the details that are in the text. Nehemiah chapter 12. Now, these are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel, the son of Shetil, and Jeshua, Sarijah, Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Maluk, Hattush, Zechaniah, Rehum, Merimoth, Edu, Jenato, Abijah, Mejamin, Ma'adijah, Bilgal, Shemaijah, Jorid, Jedidijah, Shalu, Amuk, Hilkiah, and Jedidiah. These were the heads of the priests and their brethren in the days of Jeshua. Moses, excuse me, moreover, the Levites were Jeshua, Bernay, Kamiel, Sheri, Sheribijah, Judah, and Matanijah, who led the Thanksgiving Psalms, he and his brethren. Also, Bak Bakua and Unai, their brethren, stood across from them in their duties. So these were the lists of the priests and Levites from the original return until the time of writing. Jerubabel means descendant of Bab Babel, a stranger at Babylon, a descendant of Babel. He was born in Babylon. He is a stranger. And we were introduced to this idea of a stranger, a pilgrim, wandering in a country that is not his, looking for a city whose builder and whose maker is God. So we are passing through, passing through the various nations, the various cities that we live in. This is not our home. We are looking and anticipating for a city whose builder and maker is God. Shetil means acts for of God, teaching us you have not because you ask not, that we must be in a very intimate relationship with God, asking God for wisdom, asking God to direct our paths. Joshua means a savior, a deliverer. And we know this name is the same name of Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, the savior that he is our deliverer. The genealogical records reveal the heads of the priests and Levites. Shalu means the restored one. God's going to restore us. It is in the heart of God to restore us. That's why God is married to the backslider. Amuk means deep. Hilkiah, Yahweh's portion, his portion. We 
we, we are blessed. Everything has been worked out for us. We must have faith to believe that God is working to will and to do his good pleasure in all of us. Verse 10, Yeshua begot Joachim, Joachim begot Elisha, Elisha begot Joada. Joachim means Yahweh has established, set up, delivered. God has established you in the faith. He set up, he set you up on a high place. He has delivered you from sin. He's delivered you from the bondages. He was the high priest. Jehoda, Yao knows. So God is at work. He is working. He is at work. He's strategizing, moving skillfully throughout the, the, uh, the centuries, throughout the generations, reconciling men back unto himself. Verse 12. Now in the days of Jehoiakim, the priests, the heads of the father's houses were Sharijah, Mariah, of Jeremiah, Hananiah, of Ezra, Meshulam, of Amariah, Jehoanad, Meliku, Jonathan, of Shabai, Shab Shabaniah, Joseph, of Harim, Adna, of Meribah, Helkai, of Edu, Zechariah, of Gidanah, Meshulam, of Abijah, Zikri, the son of Men, Jamin, of Moadiah, Pitai, of Bigla, Shemua, of Shemaijah, Jehonathan, of Jerarib, Matanai, of Jedadiah, Uzzah, of Saleh, Kale, of Amuk, Eber, of Hilkiah, Hash, Habiah, and of Jedaiah, Nethanel. During the reign of Darius the Persian, a record was also kept of the Levites and priests who had been heads of their father's houses in the days of Eliashib, Joada, Johanna, and Jadua. So a record of the Levites' families were kept during the reign of Darius the Persian. It is the practice of nations to keep records. So these historical records are being found and kept in museums. We are still finding historical documents that solidify and validate these activities that have taken place throughout history. Verse 23, the sons of Levi, the heads of the father's houses until the days of Johanan, the sons of Elisha were written in the book of the Chronicles. So a record of the heads of the Levi families were kept in the book of history down to the days of Johanan, the grandson of Eliashib. So we too must keep records. That's why it's important to you, for you to keep records, to keep and save the obituaries at funerals and make sure that the information within those obituaries are accurate because they become a form of record keeping. Verse 24. And the heads of the Levites were Hash, Hash Habiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, the son of Kadmiel, with their brothers across from them to praise and give thanks, group alternating with groups according to the command of David, the man of God. So what do we see? The practice. The Levites stood to praise and give thanks according to the command of David, the man of God. So they took turns in worshiping. I remember back in the days when I pastored, we would set teams and we would rotate the teams. They would have it was during the days of pagers, having pagers. They would have pagers and the groups were being paged to go to visit in hospitals or to go and console family members who perhaps may have lost loved ones. So we followed these patterns in the scriptures. Everything that, not everything, I tried 
to follow all of the patterns within the scriptures. Verse 25, Mataniah, Bakbukaya, Obadiah, Mashulam, Taman, and Arkub were gatekeepers keeping the watch at the storerooms of the gates. So we must establish a gatekeeper principle that you are responsible to cover, to scan, to protect the house of God, the place that you worship, become a gatekeeper. Look out for the brethren, pray for the leaders, pray for your pastor, pray for the elders of your church, pray for the for the, the new believers, because you at one time was a new believer and you know the tricks and the wows of the enemy. How he comes to discourage those who are new to the faith. How he tries to use old bondages to ensnare. We can no longer be entangled in the yoke of bondage of the past. So gatekeepers, verse 26. These lived in the days of Joachim, the son of Jeshua, the sons of Zozak, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and of Ezra, the priest, the scribe. Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and singing with cymbals and string instruments and harps. Now they're getting it. They're understanding that these types of functions can only take place with the Levites and with the priests. And this is so powerful because it helps us to understand as John the Revelator is writing in the book of Revelations and, 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 and exhorting us to understand that we are kings and priests of the Most High God. Now unto him who has washed us with his blood and have made us kings and priests. So we have the responsibility to, to lead and worship. So dedicate your works and accomplishments to the Lord. Celebrate joyfully all God has done for you and for his people. Note the double procession, procession for the dedication service. Ezra procession traveled around Jerusalem counterclockwise and Nehemiah's clock, clockwise coming together at the temple square. The contribution of the priest and the governor were both honored in this unique way. So strategy, strategy is interesting that they marched around similar to J Joshua as they marched around the city of Jericho. And the sons of the singers, verse 28, gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophites, from the house of Gilgal, and from the fields of Geba and Azmavet. For the singers had built themselves villages all around Jerusalem. Then the priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people, the gates and the wall. So it's important to understand why we must pray daily. We must constantly ask God for forgiveness. We must do the necessary things to keep our lives pure, addressing the sins, addressing those weaknesses, those flaws that we find in our lives and those issues and areas that the Holy Spirit convicts us in. So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two large Thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right and on the wall towards the refuse gate. After them went Harsh Haziah and half of the leaders of Judah and as as Rijah, Ezra, Meshulam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemijah, Jeremiah, and some of the priests' son with trumpets, Zechariah, the sons of Jonathan, the sons of Shemaiah, the sons of Mataniah, the sons of Micaiah, the sons of Zakur, the sons of Asaph, and his brethren, Shemaiah, Azareel, Milile, Gil, Eli, Ma'e, Nathanael, Judah, and Hananiah. 
with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. Now keep in mind, David made instruments. David set a pattern for worship. Ezra the scribe went before them. So Nehemiah led the leaders of Judah to the top of the walls and organized two large choirs to give thanks. One of the choirs proceeded southward along the top of the wall to the dung gate. Now this is important because this is the pattern that establishes choirs within churches where we worship. This is important. Worship is important. It's important for you to establish a posture, a practice, a ritual of worship at home. Don't just wait to go to church to worship, build that, that, that culture within your home. Verse 38, the others, Thanksgiving choir went the opposite way and I was behind them with half of the people on the wall going past the tower of the ovens as far as the broad wall and above the gates of Ephraim, above the old gate, above the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, the tower of the hundred as far as the sheep gate, and they stopped by the gate of the prison. Now, God is not just writing things within this book, giving us the specific details. There is something beneath the surface. Now, keep to heart the iceberg principle. We must move beyond the tenth, the one-tenth. Most people are familiar with the top of the iceberg. They never go beneath to, to discover the mass of it. So we who are given to details, we want to break open these treasures and find out exactly what God is wanting to speak to us and give us. The gate of the prison symbolizes authority and order, for example. Verse 40. So the two Thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of God. Likewise, I and the half of the rulers with me and the priest Eliakim. Messiah, Messiah, Benjamin, Mike, Mike, Aya, Eli, Nay, Zechariah, and Hananiah with trumpets. Also, Messiah, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzi, Jehahanan, Micaiah, Elam, and Ezer. The singer sang loudly with Jazz, Jazz Rai Haya, the director. So these are the 12 gates and the symbolism. The one, sheep gate, sheep market, closest gate to the altar of sacrifice. So it symbolizes sacrifice of praise and worship. Fish gate, outreach and soul winning. Old gate, God's covenant promises and foundational truths. Wisdom of the elders. Valley gate. Love and compassion for needs of others, testing and growth. Dung gate, where cities, garbage and refuge is managed, ministries of helps. Fountain gate, near King's Pool of Siloam. Spring fed, carried by aqueducts, freedom of the Holy Spirit. Water gate, preaching of the word. Horse gate, warfare, in intercessors. East gate, posture, creative spirit, golden gate, the return of Christ, inspection gate, accounting and census, Ephraim gate, fruitfulness and giving, prison gate, authority and order, matara in the Hebrew, a jail in gate towers, guardhouse. So these are the symbolisms of those 12 gates. So now we're breaking, we're broadening our understanding of the scriptures. We are digging in to find the treasures, to get an understanding. And all of our getting, we are to get an understanding. Verse 43. Also that day, they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. And at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings, the first fruits and the tithes 
to gather into them from the fields of the cities, the portions specified by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. Both the singers and the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God and the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon, his son. So many sacrifices were offered on, on that joyous day for God had given the people cause for great joy. God will give us cause for great joy. After this pandemic, we are going to come into a season of great joy. After every test comes the blessing. The women and children also participated in the celebration and the joy of the people of Jerusalem could be heard far away supported the priests and Levites were generous because they had ministered well. So in that day, we will know that people will be volunteering. People will be willing to give. People will give hilariously. They will give with great joy. They will sow and help to undergird the building and advancing of God's kingdom. Verse 46, for in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chiefs of the singers, the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In the days of Jerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, a portion for each day. They also consecrated holy things for the Levites and the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron. So the custom of having choir directors to lead the choirs in hymns of praise and thanksgiving to God began long ago in the days of David and Asaph. So now in the days of Jerubbabel and of Nehemiah, all Israel brought a daily supply of food for the singers, the gatekeepers and the Levites. They supported them. The Levites in turn gave a portion of what they received to the priests the descendant of Aaron, Nehemiah chapter 13. On that day, they read from the book of Moses in the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assemblies of God because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. So it was when they had heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. Did you hear that? Those who curse you will be turned into a blessing. God will turn the curse into a blessing. Syncretism, and this is a good word because we see this philosophical practice in our day, a mashing of various religions. People are now mixing religions, religious beliefs because they have been deceived that there are many ways to God. There is only one way to God and that's through his son. Now, how God accomplishes this with people who are sincere and seeking him, it only God knows. Syncretism had been the source of much trouble for Israel. Now, action was taken to ensure that never again would the remnant turn aside to add other gods to their worship of Yahweh. They recovered the word of instruction from the book of Moses. They followed the instruction to the letter. They separated all the mixed multitudes from Israel. So now we see the strategy how the enemy would love to deceive us and separate us. Mixed multitudes come in to pollute. Verse four, now before this, Elisha, the priest, having authority over the storehouse, the storerooms of the house of our God, was uh, allied with Tobiah. And he had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offering for the priests. 
be diligent to follow God's way and repent for sin each time he convicts you. He will bless you as you do. Understand that you have to follow the book. It is hard to imagine the audacity of Tobijah, the Ammonite, as soon as Nehemiah left for Persia, Tobijah had dared to move into a room in the temple. Upon his return, a various perturbed Nehemiah ejects Tobiah, Tobijah with his furniture, the ungodly connection of Eliashib, the priest, and Tobiah was exposed. Tobiah, corruption was revealed. Verse six, but during all this, I was not in Jerusalem, for in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Then after certain days, I obtained leave from the king. And I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobijah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And it grieved me bitterly. bitterly. Therefore, I threw all the household goods of Tobijah out of the room. Then I commanded them to clean the room. And I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. You notice that? That we must, we must bring corrective action into what we see in church. We must build a reform house of God. Nehemiah discovered the evil of, of Eliashib and Tobijah. This is likened to Jesus and the money changers, Matthew 21, 12. We must be radical in our efforts to rid the church of the evil that has crept in. Verse 10, I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. So I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. The Levites have been scattered during the years because of inadequate financial support. Now the tithes were paid. Malachi presents this message clearly in the days following Nehemiah. Malachi 3. Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. How so have we robbed you? In tithes and in offerings. Nehemiah sacrificed a great deal in order to minister to his people. For he seemed quite sure that God is not in anyone's debt. He prays three times in this chapter that God would remember him and reward him for his good deeds. We can express devotion to God by generously giving to the work of the Lord and by making sure we are caring for his servants. Ensure that God's servants are well cared for. Lift unnecessary burdens from them and enable them to fully give their time and strength to the work of the Lord, to the work the Lord has given them. Tithe regularly. So God's work can move forward liberally. So Nehemiah discovered the evils of Eliashib and Tobiah. This is likened to Jesus and the money changers, as we mentioned earlier. So here we are learning and studying and seeing how we must build accurately. Verse 11, so I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. Verse 12, then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And I appointed as treasures over the storehouse, Shelemiah, the priest, and Zadok, the scribe, and of the Levites, Padadiah. And next to them was Hanan the son of Zakur, the son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful and their task was to distribute to their brethren. Remember me, my God, concerning this and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have 
done for the house of my God and for his service. So now we're seeing keys to breakthrough. This is how you break through, break through the bondage, break through those systems that are trying to prevent you from reaching the next level in God. Verse 15, in those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens, which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. Men of Tyre dwelt there also who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, what evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? 30 years had passed since Ezra's initial ministry concerning the Sabbath, and the people had begun to violate the day during Nehemiah's second term as governor. Nehemiah's warning was that the same sin would produce the same dire results. The Sabbath was to be observed according to the Mosaic law. The people were to rest on the Sabbath day. Then Jesus said to them, the Sabbath was made to meet the needs of people and not people to meet the requirements of the Sabbath. Mark 2, 27. The Jews had turned the Sabbath into a day of religious bondage. Now understand, we learned that the children of the sons of Ephraim turned back in the day of battle because they did not keep the word before. If we do not keep the word before us, then we will stray backwards into these, into these um, practices that are error these practices that are not perpendicular, these practices that are not true to scripture. So here, this is why in Jesus' day, he rebuked the scribes and the Pharisees because they had imposed the burden upon the people. They would rescue animals, but they would not allow people to be healed or prayed for. Did you, not your fathers do thus? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us in this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. So it was at the gates of Jerusalem, as it began to be dark before the Sabbath, that I commanded the gates to be shut and charged that they must not be open till after the Sabbath. Then I posted some of my servants at the gate so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. Now the merchants and sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. So we see there has to be a radical move to preserve the word of God so that we may grow. Verse 21, then I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you from that time on from that time on, they came no more on the Sabbath. And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. In those days, I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. And half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. So the Levites are to purify themselves and guard the gates in order to preserve the holiness of the Sabbath. When we purify our lives and guard our hearts, then will we see the powerful manifestations of signs and wonders, the Lord working with us, confirming the word of our God. We are not told that Nehemiah dissolved existing interfaith marriages, but he did rebuke them forcefully. Deuteronomy 7, 3 was vigorously enforced for all future marriages. So I contended with them and cursed them, struck some of them and pulled out their hair and made them swear by God saying, 
You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. You shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. We must instill in our children the importance of vetting relationships. To marry outside of the faith is to bring unwanted trouble upon themselves. Verse 26, did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations, there was no king like him who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. Nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? And one of the sons of Joada, the sons of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sambalat the Hornite. Therefore, I drove him from me. So these two, Sambalat the Hornite and Tobiah the Ammonite, conspired against the building. You see. Verse 29. Remember them, O oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. Thus I cleansed them of everything pagan. I also assign duties to the priests and Levites, each of his service. So those of you who have trinkets in your home, get rid of it. Those of you who have Buddha statues, nice little statues, little idols, get rid of them. Stop going to tarot card readers or fortune tellers. Get rid of those practices. You cannot mix those practices with the faith. Cleanse yourself. Repent. Verse 31, and bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at the appointed times. Remember me, oh my God, for good. So I purged out everything foreign and assigned tasks to the priests and Levites, making certain that each knew his work. This is a recapitulation of reforms in which Nehemiah shows that he has fulfilled his calling. His satisfaction with the results is seen in his final prayer in which he rests his case making no additional requests for rewards. Wow, powerful. So we must be radical, just as Jesus says, if your right arm offend you, cut it off. Psalm 37, do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity. So again, keys to break to, don't fret because of evildoers. Don't, don't, don't get upset because evil people are prospering and you seem to be struggling. Just know that God has a plan for you. God is working things out. You are just on the verge of a significant breakthrough because God now is giving you the keys for a spiritual breakthrough. Don't be envious of the workers of iniquity. See, where there is envy and strife, there is every evil work. So don't allow envy to come into your heart. Envy means I hurt at your success. This is an alphabetical psalm, another acrostic, which where each pair of lines begins with successive letters of the Hebrew alphabet. It is written to men rather than to God and contrasts the lifestyle of the wicked and deceitful with the righteous and forgiving. Don't worry about the wicked or envy those who do wrong. Verse two, for they shall soon be cut down like grass and wither as the green herb. So the faith of evildoers may not seem soon when compared with a lifetime or with a human history, but when compared with the length of eternity, their presence and impact is brief. So don't get bent out of shape. Because of the activity of the evil ones, just continue to pray and ask God to move within your cities, knowing that the evil doers will meet their fate. Verse three, trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. So trust God, trust, trust. That's what faith is, is to believe God, to trust in God to be dependent upon God, do good, do what is right, 
dwell in the land, feed on his faithfulness, feeding on the word, reminding yourselves of the exploits, reminding yourselves of the blessings, reflect on how God delivered you. Remember the testimonies that God has given unto you. Eight times the thought dwell in the land or inherit the land is mentioned, showing to the righteous Jews that their future is secure. Trust in the Lord and do good. Then you will live safely in the land and prosper. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit everything you do to the Lord. Trust him and he will help you. Verse four, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. So the word heart is led. Heart, intellect, awareness, mind, inner person, inner feelings, deepest thoughts, inner self. As in English, the Hebrew concept of heart encompasses both the physical organ and a person's inner yearning. Perhaps the noblest occurrence of lead is Deuteronomy 6, 5, commanding Israel to love the Lord with all your heart. Jesus laid great emphasis on this sentence. Jeremiah states that the human heart can be the most deceitful thing in the world. But verses 10 shows that the Lord is still able to sort out and analyze what lies within the heart. Verse 7, rest in the Lord and patiently wait for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his ways. because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. The believer who waits patiently for God's timing has nothing to fear or be envious of. Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. Don't worry about evil people who prosper or fret about their wicked schemes. Know that God is delivering you. See your future. See your breakthrough. Cease from anger, verse eight, and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. For evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait on the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. For yet a little while, and the wicked shall be no more. Indeed, you will look carefully for his place, but it shall be no more. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. Jesus sees application of this in the kingdom of God where the meek reign. Meekness is not weakness, but a gentleness of spirit that connotes remarkable strength. Yes. But all who humble themselves before the Lord shall be given every blessing and shall have wonderful peace. So weakness, meekness is not weakness. If you think weakness, meekness is weakness, try being meek for a week. The spirit, the wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him and he sees that his day is coming. The wicked have drawn the sword and have bent their bows to cast down the poor and needy, to slay those who are of upright conduct. Their sword shall enter their own heart and their bows shall be broken. A little that a righteous man has is better than the riches of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the day of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. So God keeps a record of the economic inequities in nation and of the oppression of the poor. And there will be a day of reckoning. We are living in a day of reckoning. We are living where God is flattening things out. There is an equalization that's taking place in the earth. The day by day, the Lord, takes care of the innocent and they will receive an inheritance that lasts forever. They will not be ashamed in the time of evil and in the days of famine, they will have abundance. 
The Lord knows the day of the upright and their inheritance shall be forever. They shall not be ashamed in the evil time in the days of famine. They shall be satisfied, but the wicked shall perish and the enemies of the Lord, like the splendor of the meadows, shall vanish into smoke. They shall vanish away. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. The godly are generous givers for those blessed by him shall inherit the earth, but those cursed by him shall be cut off. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his ways. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their life. Though they stumble, they will never fall for the Lord holds them by the hand. Though he falls, he shall not be utterly cast down for the Lord upholds him with his hand. I have been young and now am old yet. I have not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging for bread. I have never seen the Lord forsake a man who loves him nor shall I see the children of the godly go hungry. Verse 26, he is ever merciful and lends and his descendants are blessed, depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. Keys to breakthrough. We're learning how to break through. We're learning how to overcome our enemies. For the Lord loves justice and does not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever, but the descendants of the wicked shall be cut off. The righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The mouth of the righteous shall speak wisdom and his tongue talk of justice. The law of his God is in his heart. None of his steps shall slide. The wicked watches the righteous and seeks to slay him. The Lord will not leave him in his hand nor condemn him when he is judged. Wait on the Lord and keep his way and he shall exalt you to inherit the land. When the wicked are cut off, you shall see it. I have seen the wicked in great power and spreading himself like a native green tree. So wait on God. Breakthrough comes as a result of waiting. Don't become impatient. Wait. And again, I say, wait, wait on God. This verse summarizes this Psalm. For the Lord loves justice. He will never abandon the godly. He will keep them safe forever, but the children of the wicked will die. The godly will possess the land and will live there forever. The godly offer good counsel. They teach right from wrong. They have made God's law their own. So they will never slip from his path. This is why we study line upon line, precept upon precept, because the word is our wisdom. Yet he has passed, verse 36, away. And behold, he was no more. Again, indeed, I sought him, but he could not be found. Look at those who are honest and good for a wonderful future awaits those who love peace, mimic their behavior and grab hold of eternal life. Mark the blameless man and observe the upright for the future of that man is peace, but the transgressor shall be destroyed altogether. The future of the wicked shall be cut off, but the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their strength in the time of trouble and the Lord shall help them in, and deliver them. He shall deliver them from the wicked and save them because they trust in him. So the Lord saves the godly. He is their salvation and their refuge. When trouble comes because they trust in him, he helps them and delivers them from the plots of evil men keys to spiritual breakthrough. The primary thought of this psalm is trusting God to bring about economic justice in his time. James chapter two, human worth, divine destiny. These are keys. These are keys to spiritual breakthrough. My brethren, do not hold the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. the glory, the Lord of glory with partiality. Don't be discriminant. Treat everyone the same, celebrate. Don't have one offering from one person and another different offering from, for the other. Treat them. Don't be kind to one person and disregards the other. 
an empty religion will betray itself in relationship to make superficial distinctions among people. Preferring those of prestige and positions is incompatible with the faith of our Lord, which excludes favoritism based on wealth or class. We have been ensnared by the enemy to be discriminate towards people. We're discriminate. We only want to hear popular people teach. You must learn that the, 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 the anointing, the glory rests upon even those who are modest. Everyone deserves to be treated well. Understanding human dignity changes the way we treat our fellow human beings. Until we discover for ourselves our worth and value in Christ, we will struggle to treat others with the dignity and respect every human being should enjoy. When we truly consider God's profound interest in all people, our interaction, acknowledge his love for them. Despite ethnic origin, social, economic background, or physical appearance, we are called to treat everyone around us and as an equal. The idea of preferential treatment among God's people is evidence that people are operating outside of God's kingdom principle. Christ can be found in every unique individual. So let us love, respect, and serve each other as we love, respect, and serve the Lord. My dear brothers and sisters, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Godly living is a primary focus in the book of James, which gives us practical, practical instructions about living and growing in godliness. James has been called the Proverbs of the New Testament. Study and apply its wisdom, guidelines, and concrete principles to your everyday life. By God's grace, seek to live in righteousness and peace in all that you think, say, and do. Love all people regardless of social or economic status. Love others the way Jesus loves you unconditionally. My dear brother and sister, how can you claim to have faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ if you favor some people over others? Verse two, for if there should come into your assembly a man with gold rings and fine apparel, there should also come in a poor man in filthy clothes and you pay attention to the one wearing the fine clothes and say to him, you sit here in a good place and say to the poor man, you stand there or sit here at my footstool. How many times we have been discriminated towards people. We refuse to sit next to people who look soil. Assembly is literally synagogue, possibly suggesting that the letter was written before Jewish Christians adopted a different name for their gathering. On the other hand, the term may have been used interchangeably with the word church. Verse four. Have you not shown partiality among yourselves and become judged with evil thoughts? Those who frown upon the rich while despising the poor determines the true value of a person by worldly standards and reveal evil thoughts such as covetousness and pride. I recall when a celebrity who I will not mention came to a church that I'm familiar with, immediately greedy people tried to connect. Their actions actually drove the celebrity from the church because he could see the covetous spirit of the people. Evil thoughts, seduction. Verse five, listen, my brother, beloved brethren, has not God chosen the poor of this world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he promised to those who love him? God has chosen poor people to be rich in faith and the kingdom of heaven is theirs. For that is the gift of God has promised to all those who love them. Brokenness and humility are key factors for obtaining the kingdom. 
This is why we practice humility and brokenness. This is why we fast. This is why we study the word so that we can walk in humility. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Verse six, but you have dishonored the poor man. Do not the rich oppress you and drag you into the courts. Do they not blaspheme that noble name by which you are called? James is not speaking exhaustively, characterizing all rich people. He is obviously describing certain rich unbelievers who were exploiting the poor and blaspheming Jesus. You have insulted the poor. It is not the rich who are exploiting you. The world is being judged for their cruelty towards the poor. The world is being judged today, being judged. See, we fail to call it what it is. We have famine in the land, no rain in the West. We have dry land, fires burning throughout the countries, fires burning in, in Europe. We have storms coming storms coming. We have pestilences, plagues taking place. God is judging the world for how they have dealt with the poor. Verse eight, if you really fulfill the law, royal law, according to the scriptures, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You do well. The royal law commanding us to love is the king of laws. Key, another key. The royal law, love your neighbor as yourself, comprehending all other commandments, dealing with human relationships. To favor some people over others, you are committing a sin. You are guilty of breaking the law. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. But if you show partiality, you commit sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Believers cannot love their neighbors as themselves and show partiality because the two are mutually exclusive. To show the favoritism described in this passage is to commit sin. Show partiality is pro so politio from pro sopan, a face, and lambano to lay hold of. The word denotes making distinction among people based on their rank or influence, showing preference for the rich and powerful. The impartial God shows to all people the same love, grace, blessings, and benefit of his salvation. James does not teach that, the, that to commit one sin, such as murder or adultery, is to be guilty of every other individual sin listed in the law. He views the law as an expression of God's will, which is an unfragmented whole so that breaking any parts of the law constitutes breaking the law as a whole. To disregard God's will as revealed in the law is not merely to break an isolated rule. It is to rebel against God himself. So for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet stumble in one point, he is guilty of all. Verse 11, for he who says, do not commit adultery, also says, do not murder. Now, if you do not commit adultery, but you do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and so do as those who will be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. What does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith save him? So the law of liberty references the standard of divine love, which becomes the Christian's ultimate standard of conduct. There will be no mercy for those who have not shown mercy to others. But if you 
have been merciful, God will be merciful when he judges you. What good is it, dear brothers and sisters, if you say you have faith, but don't show it by your actions? Can that kind of faith save anyone? James does not set faith against works, but discusses two kinds of faith, a dead faith and a saving faith. Saving faith is not simply a profession or an empty claim, nor is it merely the acceptance of creed. Saving faith is that which produces an obedient life. Paul's emphasis on the Christian life at its inception, justification, is not antagonistic to James' position. For Paul also believes in justification producing the fruit of works. The question is literally, can that kind of faith, the kind that does not issue, does not issue in good works, save him? The implied answer is no. If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, depart in peace, be warm and feel but you do not give them the things which are needed for the body, what does it profit? Thus, also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. So you see, faith by itself is not enough unless it produces good deeds. It is dead and useless. But some, one will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that there is one God. You do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. But do you want to know, O oh foolish man, that faith without works is dead? So let your faith be evident to all by your good works. Our works show the genuineness of what we profess. Some say the way to God is by faith alone plus nothing. Well, I say that good works are important too, for without good works, you can't prove whether you have faith or not. But anyone can see that I have faith by the way I act. Intellectual assent to a creed is not saving faith. So we must become doers of the word and not hearers only. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered Isaac his son on the altar? Do you see that faith was working together with his works and by works faith was made perfect? So God pronounced Abraham righteous the moment he believed. But it was only by his later obedience that he demonstrated the reality of his righteousness. Abraham was shown to be right with God by his actions when he offered his son Isaac on the altar. Is it not evident that a person is made right with God, not by a barren faith, but by faith fruitful in works? Faith creates works. Works perfect faith. Let me say that again. Faith creates work. Works perfect faith. Working together. Synergio, compare, synergis or synergism from sun together and ergio to work, hence to cooperate, help, collaborate, collaborate. There is a practical harmony of synergism between vertical faith in God and horizontal work to a needy world. Faith is both spiritual and practical. And the scriptures were fulfilled, which says Abraham believed God and it was accounted to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see then that a man is justified by works and not by faith only. Likewise, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and send them out another way? James and Paul do not contradict each other. Paul emphasizes that faith is not religious deed without a born again heart. James stresses that faith is not a born again heart without deed. Neither would agree to the validity of an empty creedal faith. Abraham was upright, founding patriarch, while Rahab 
represent the average person at the other end of the social and moral scale. Both, however, were justified on the same base. For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So experience breakthrough. There are two keys to experiencing breakthrough, faith and works. The way we have faith is by asking God and hearing his word. Once he tells us what to do, we can have faith to act on it. The reason we can respond in faith is that we have heard God and faith comes by hearing. But James 2.26 also says, faith without works is dead. A word similar to works is obedience. To experience breakthrough in the blessed life not only takes faith, it also takes obedience. God is eager to lead us into blessings. But when he directs us to do something, we have to obey. To increase in faith, we obey what he says. Then we obey the next thing and on and on. It's also important to obey promptings from the Holy Spirit. The more we obey, the more we can expect God to lead us. Taking time to hear God is vital to spiritual maturity and a blessed life. The only way to experience the breakthroughs we need is through faith and obedience. What a word. If this word has blessed you, encouraged you this morning, please hit the like button and also share it. Thank you for joining Dr. Earl for today's broadcast. Please be sure to follow us on our website at anthonyearl.org. To make a ministry donation, you can visit anthonyearl.org and click on the donation tab, or you can text to give. Simply text the word GIVE to 773-245-1640. Follow the broadcast on YouTube and join our Facebook group, Anthony Earl Ministries, Discover Prophetic Truth in Scripture. This program airs daily at 8 a.m. Pacific, 10 a.m. Central, 11 a.m. Eastern Time.